chapter from the subject of harboring hurt. Harboring hurt. I want to talk to you about that today. Um, those of you that were with us last Sunday, I talked from the subject of cultivating courage. And one of the statements that I made last week was that one of the things that I did know for sure, I did know for sure about 2021 is that as we faced it, we would have to face it with courage. I taught from the life of a man by the name of Job. And when Job had lost everything in his life in a 24 hour period, uh, including his health and his family, his children, Job said in chapter one and 21 in the New, Liv New Living Translation, he said, I came naked from my mother's womb and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. Now the King James Version says, blessed be the name of the Lord. Job was saying to us, listen, it was the Lord that gave it to me uh, it, and it was the Lord's, uh, it, when he gave it to me, it was also the Lord's when he took it away. He was saying, uh, basically, I refuse to be bitter over what I have lost. I, I think that Job must have had an understanding uh, that grief was good, but bitterness was bad. I said grief was good, but bitterness was bad. He must have had an understanding that pain uh, wouldn't necessarily kill you, but bitterness would kill you. I think he understood that sorrow and grief may harm you, uh, but resentment has the uh, ability to destroy you. Job must have understood that resentment has a way of prolonging your pain. It does not relieve it. Uh, all it does is reinforce it, and it actually takes your pain and it makes it worth. Uh, makes it worse. I've often said, and people have looked at me crazy, but I've often said that grief um, is really a gift from God. And, and I say that because it has the ability to help us transition through life. As we start facing the transitions in life, God gives us the ability to grieve. And, and we need to just settle the issue once and for all that we are going to have pain and that we are going to suffer loss from time to time and that we are uh, going to grieve, but we cannot allow uh, a season of grief to turn into a lifestyle of grief. That's really good and I'm gonna say that again. <clears throat> we cannot allow a season of grief. God only meant for it to come as a season. There is a time to mourn, the Bible says. There is a season for everything. So there may be a season for grief, but God said, I don't want you to live there so long that you turn that season of grief into a lifestyle of grief because ultimately that can destroy us. So we have to understand that yes, losses are going to come, but uh, 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 losses might deepen us, but they do not define us. I think I should say that one more time. Losses might deepen us, but they do not define us. Uh, they, they do not define who we are. You are not the divorce that you went through. You are not the failure that you went through. You are not the disability that you have. You, you are not uh, uh, the, the disappointment that you came through. You are not your difficulty. So I say losses might deepen us a little bit, but they do not have the power to define us unless we give them that power. They are a part of our maturity, but they are not a part of our identity. I said they are a part of maturing us, but they are not a part of of our identity. It's, it's, it's just something that happened to me, but it is not me. That's why I often say you can make a mistake and not be a mistake. So uh, there has to come a season in your life where you say, okay, uh, I went through that, but that is not who I am. So I've got to let it go. I got to let it go out of my heart. I've got to let it go out of my mind. I've got to let it go out of my spirit. And I'm going to set my face like a flint towards what God God has 
next for me. Job's wife didn't understand that. And so she looked at him and she said, you need to just curse God and die. In other words, what she was, she was saying is you ought to just be resentful. You ought to be bitter. You should not be where you are. You shouldn't have lost what you've lost. You shouldn't be facing what you are facing, Job. You should just give up on God. But Job refused to become bitter. I mean to tell you, he had a massive loss in a 24-hour period. But Job said, I am not going to become bitter. He said in Hebrews, uh, or Hebrews 2 says this, watch out that no bitterness take root, uh, that there be no root of bitterness among you. See, pain is inevitable. We are going to face that. But misery is optional. And bitterness makes us miserable. I said pain is inevitable, but misery is optional. And bitterness is what makes us miserable. Our nation um, is filled with people that are suffering with bitterness. They are people that are hurting and uh, they have hurt so long that they have allowed bitterness to get into the root of their life. And uh, if, if, if you saw what I saw this week, if you looked at the images that I saw uh, of coming out of Washington this week, uh, when our nation was suffering a horrible, a horrible attack, uh, I was just literally stunned. It was one of those moments where like on 9-11, I knew exactly where I was when I turned my TV on and I saw it. Well, that's how I think that this attack on our nation is going to be remembered. As I sat there in my house and stood there and just walked and paced and just trying to take it all in as I was watching rioters desecrate and vandalize and dishonor and disrespect our, uh, our Capitol building and threaten the lives of those lawmakers that were on the inside. Uh, I, 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 just, I just was stunned. And when I watched them get in and I watched them begin to sit in the chair that our vice president had just sat down in, when I watched them sit behind the, the desks of some of the leaders of this nation talking about things like, this is our house. Well, first of all, I just want to say to you, if it's your house, then uh, why didn't you use your key to get in instead of coming through the window? So I'm just going to leave that right there. This is my desk, putting their feet up on a desk. And, and this is us. This is who we are. We're free people. All the while, while you're telling us that, your actions are declaring something completely different. Your actions are telling us that you are not free at all. Your actions are telling us that you are bound and that you're bound with bitterness and that you're bound with anger and that you're bound with all kinds of craziness going on. Uh, you're bound with things that have taken root down deep inside of you. Things that you should have gotten uh, rid of a long time ago. And, and furthermore, I'm going to go on the record and say anybody that can tolerate or anybody that can support or anybody that can try to vindicate or condone what we saw on our television screens this week. Anybody that can condone that kind of behavior. To me, you are just as guilty as those who have committed these crimes. Now, please understand this. I know that it's possible for us to be frustrated. I know that there are uh, millions and millions of people that are disappointed. I know that many of, uh, uh, of people, uh, uh, numbers of people are angry. And, and, but, but I want to tell you, even God understands anger. So, so the, being angry is not the issue. He actually said in his word, be angry. You can be angry. I get it. But he also said, while you're angry, make sure that you sin not. You can be angry, but don't be so angry that you allow anger to push you into sin. That's what he's saying. Be angry, but sin not. The word sin there means to miss the mark. It means to morally err. It means to miss or to wander from the path of righteousness. It means to wander from the path of honor. It means to do wrong 
or it means to go wrong. So be angry, but don't do wrong and don't go wrong. And, and, and listen, I will tell you one of the greatest lessons of my life. I wished I had a dollar for every time I heard my mother say this, but she taught me so well when she would say things to me like, Cheryl, two wrongs will never make a right. Two wrongs will never make a right. And after that you have declared truth, and at some point uh, after that you have, have, have stated how you feel, uh, after that at some point you got to put it in to the hands of God. You have to put it into the hands of God because let me tell you, you something the facts are we are living in a world that is broken we are living in a broken world and we are a world that is broken because of sin people are going to be disappointed people are going to be angry we are going uh, to have moments that we feel overwhelmed we're going to have moments that we feel frustrated because we we are imperfect people I don't care what your label is it doesn't matter if if, if your church of God in Christ. It doesn't matter if you're Baptist. It doesn't matter if you're non-denominational. It doesn't matter if you're Democratic or if you're Republican. We are all uh, imperfect people. But the real question that we have to answer is how are we going to handle the things that hurt us? How how do you handle hurt in your life? When you have been hurt, I'm not talking about just being frustrated and I'm not just talking about being fin offended, but I want to talk to you today about how you as an individual process the hurt that you have gone through in your life. Because rest assured, hurt is going to come. Hurt has come and hurt shall continue to come. And when it does, we have to have the ability to handle it properly. I, I said we got to handle it properly because hurt that is held onto as opposed to hurt that is let go, it is going to fester inside of us. It is going to grow inside of us. And it is going to multiply inside of us. And as long as we live in a culture that is filled with anger, that is filled with slander and filled with hate and filled with divisiveness and filled with bitterness and prejudice and bias, we have got to learn how to handle the hate, the, the, the hurt that rises and hate that rises up inside of us. We have got to learn to process it correctly and as bad as what you and I saw this week uh, on the news uh, and, and what happened in our nation uh, I, I'm, I'm telling you this is as bad as it was this is not the first time I, I feel like it's the worst divisiveness I have ever uh, experienced in my lifetime but it's really it's really nothing new okay humans have always been self-centered humans have always uh, been uh, uh, after their own uh, their own pleasure their own whatever they want people have uh, human beings have always uh, been like that it's nothing new I read it in Romans I believe it was earlier this week where what Paul had to say about his culture which was 2,000 years ago and Paul said this in Romans 3 and 12 he said everyone is turned from God and all have gone wrong no one anywhere has kept on doing what is right not one uh, their talk is foul and filthy like the stench from an open grave their tongues are loaded with lies everything they say has in it the sting and the passion of deadly snakes their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness they are quick to kill they are hating anyone who disagrees with them when uh, wherever they go they leave misery and trouble behind them and they have never known what it is to feel secure or to enjoy God's blessings Paul's culture then sounds a whole lot 
like our culture today and 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 ju just just it's just about the same what 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 Paul was talking about then in, in the Roman culture is what we're dealing with today and as Paul was writing about what was happening in Rome James right right there beside him James came along and James began writing to the believers and to the Christians that were spread out among those that were there and the reason that James began to write is because he didn't want those believers to be infected with the negative culture that Paul was describing back there in in the book of Romans he didn't want them picking up their bad habits he didn't want them picking up their attitudes he didn't want them to have the same attitude and the same thinking process as the world that they were living in had so with great boldness he and and also with great, great clarity James says to them look you guys you guys can't be acting like this because when you act like this, you are no different than non-believers. And what makes it so sad is that you all know better than to be acting like this. He said, you are being hypocritical. You should not be acting like this and you know you shouldn't. So it's hypocritical. You know you can't be all sweet and, and loving at the church and, and then be mean and nasty and hateful and demeaning of other people uh, who are in the world. So James says to them in 3, uh, 9, and 10, he said, you can't be praising God and then cursing the people who are made in his likeness and in his image. Uh, 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 sweet water and bitter water cannot come out of the same fountain. He said, you can't, you can't be like that. He's saying, uh, whenever it looks like sweet water and bitter water is coming out of the same fountain, that is a contradiction. Fresh water and salt water does not come and flow from the same source. Uh, he's telling us if, 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 we're, if words of blessing and words of cursing uh, and words of bitterness are coming out uh, from you, uh, uh, let me back up and say it like this. If words of praise and victory and honor are coming out of you when you connect with the church, but then when you connect on social media or when you're at home with just your kids or whatever, and you start talking and bitterness comes out of you and hatefulness comes out of you. Uh, he says, no, no, there's a problem with that. When you start talking to people who are politically opposed to you and it comes out bitter and hateful and you come in the, to the church and you start praising God, something is wrong with that. There's bitter and sweet water trying to come out of the same fountain. So he, what he's saying to us is if you are like that, then and you have a problem that is in your heart. He is saying, evidently, you are holding on to some kind of hidden hurt that has set itself up in your heart. You may say, well, why can't I hold on to how I feel? Why can't I just stay bitter? I've been through so much in my life, Pastor Brady. I'm all right as long as I got God. Me and God, we got our own thing going. Uh, so, so why can't I just stay like I am? And I'll tell you why today. Because it's really never just you and God. It's the world that he puts you into. If you are living and you're in the world, you're in this world for a reason. We are the light. We say it every Sunday, shine, Lord. We are a light. That's, we are a city that's set up on a hill and we cannot be hidden. And the reason we can't hold this bitterness and this hatred that we are, are, that too many of us have in our hearts is because there is a huge price tag that is attached to the bitterness that so many of us are holding on to. And to be quite frank, it is, it, it, you, we cannot afford it. There is a bitterness that is trying to root itself in, to be divisive in our nation, in our family, uh, 
uh, amongst our family members. And we cannot, that's a price that is way too high. It's a price that we should not be willing to pay. And I have no doubt that many of you that are listening to me today are carrying a heavy load of hurt. I get it. We've been through a whole lot. And, and you probably uh, don't feel like just simply letting it go. You don't, you don't feel like you want to forgive yet. You don't feel like you want to let it go yet. But my prayer is today that I can help you to understand that there is a high cost to harboring hurt deep down within your heart. I'm going to say it again. There is a high cost to harboring hurt when it roots itself deep down within your heart. One of the things that it will cost us uh, any time, uh, and, and let me just go on the record and say this, I'm not just talking about politics today. I know I mentioned that, and I mentioned what happened, happened in D.C., but I'm, I'm talking about issues that we have with one another, issues that we have in our family, things that have gone back for years and years, but we still are harboring those hurts. I'm going to tell you today that you cannot afford to do that because, number one, any time you harbor hurt and hold on to hurt that is deep in your heart, you and I are moving outside of the will of God. I'm going to say that again. Anytime you hold on to hurt and harbor it deep within your heart, you are moving in a direction that is out side of the will of God. Don't come to me and say, tell me what my purpose is. I want to know my purpose. I, I want to know the will of God for my life. The first thing I'm going to tell you is to examine your heart. Father, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me because anytime we harbor things in our heart it takes us outside of the will of God for our lives whenever we decide to harbor hurt down in our heart we are choosing I said we are choosing to disobey God we are choosing to forfeit his blessing on our lives we are choosing to say we're not going to be used by him. James 1 and 20 says, if you are angry, if you are angry, I'm going to say that again. If you are angry, you cannot do any of the good things that God wants done. If you are dealing with anger, you cannot do any of the good things that God wants done. Uh, let me give you that in another translation. Uh, it, one other translation says, anger will not help you live the good life that God wants you to have. Uh, another version says, human anger does not does not achieve God's righteous purpose. Human anger will never achieve God's righteous purpose. So Job in chapter 36 and 13, he says this, those who have wicked hearts, they hold on to anger. Oh, do y'all hear that? Those, let me say it like this. Those who hold on to anger have got wicked hearts uh, and, and, and angry and bitter uh, filled hearts, hearts that are filled with bitterness, they ultimately end up producing resentment and resentment will ultimately move you away from the will of God in your life. Maybe somebody watching me today says, I feel like I've struggled all my life to find the will of God. Well, maybe, just maybe, God brought me into your home today or into your hearing today to tell you if you would just stop and pause and start saying, God, show me me, not just what you want for me, but show me me. And if I can make the correction in my heart, then it might not be as difficult for me to see your will for my life. So the, the, the second reason that we cannot hold on or harbor uh, the hurt that is inside of us is because of this. Number two, any time that I retain resentment, I stop my own happiness. 
any time that I retain and hold on to resentment, I stop my own happiness. It's not what he has done or what she has done or what they have done. It's what I am doing to myself. Quit fussing and getting angry at other people because you yourself uh, uh, are not happy. It's number one, it's not their job to make you happy. It's not my job to make you happy. Some of y'all are frustrated with me right now. That's okay. I still have to preach the gospel. I'm not giving you my word today. I'm giving you the word of God today. And any time that we retain, hold on, and allow ourselves to be controlled, even if it's the slightest bit of resentment in our hearts, then it's going to cause a mess in our life because happiness stops dead in its tracks when it runs head on into resentment. The moment that I choose to get upset with somebody and stay upset with somebody, the moment that I choose to be resentful, the moment that I choose to not go into a prayer closet and wrestle it down in my own heart. The moment that I choose to hold a grudge against somebody, that is the moment that I choose unhappiness. And it is not anybody's fault but my own because the fact is happiness is a choice and you, my brothers and my sisters, are as happy as you want to be right now. You're as happy as you want to be you are as just like I've said you are as close to God as you choose to be because God hasn't moved if you're not close to him it's because you moved he didn't move and happiness if you are not happy you need to understand that it is a choice it is a decision all hell can be breaking loose in my life but if I'm able to take a breath that's something I should be happy about I said if I'm able to breathe if I have the activity of my limbs if I can just think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me that right there itself is reason enough to be happy and if you will nourish and feed those little seeds of happiness the next thing you know you'll have a harvest that will overtake all of the frustration and all of the anger and all of the bitterness and all of the revenge that is trying to spring up in your life if you will nourish those seeds of the goodness of God in your life he will make sure that they raise up and they smother out everything else that tries to make you unhappy ungrateful and all of that mess that goes with that so if you choose to focus on something that is hurting you if you choose to focus on the person that has made you mad. If you choose to focus on or, or, or on on the uh, on resentment and on things like rage, you are going to be unhappy. Job said in twenty one verse twenty three, he said, "Some men stay happy until the day uh, that they die, and others have no happiness at all because they live and die." with bitter hearts. They live and they die. They live with bitter hearts and they ultimately die with bitter hearts. So we, we need to remember that you cannot be bitter and happy at the same time. So we need to take it to God. If somebody has broken your heart, if somebody has offended you, take it into your prayer closet and wrestle that thing down because Whatever it's making you feel, it is not worth it. I said it is absolutely not worth it. The third thing that you, the reason that you have to get rid and not harbor hurt down in your heart is because this, any time that I breathe bitterness, I suffocate my spirit. I said any time that I breathe in bitterness, I suffocate my spirit. Throughout this pandemic, we've heard people say, uh, people that have recovered from COVID-19, you've heard them say, I, many of them, you've heard them say, I struggled, I struggled to breathe. I, I just could not breathe. That's what George Floyd said when the man had his knee on his neck. He said, I 
cannot breathe. And when you and I have bitterness in our heart, then we cannot breathe in our spirit. What all of that did to people who were struggling with COVID-19, what it, what, what it did to George Floyd in the natural, that is what happens to us in the spirit. When we breathe in bitterness, it will suffocate our spirit. And the minute something tries to take our breath, instead of saying, hey, that's, that's not right. I don't like how I feel. I don't like how this made me feel. Something is going on. Instead of fighting against that, we just keep breathing it in. Next thing you know, our spirit has been stifled. We can no longer hear our spirit because all we hear is our flesh. All we hear is our flesh saying things that are that, that 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 it's coming out through resentment and rage and hurt and so we have to understand that any time that we uh, t breathe in bitterness it's going to knock us down in our spirit so it, it, what happens it's like you are choosing it's like not just you but it's like me we are choosing Whenever we carry bitterness, we are carrying uh, an extra load. We are carrying extra weight because bitterness weighs you down. You don't run like you used to run when you become full of bitterness. You don't act like you used to act. You can't move as quick. You can't dream as quick. You can't praise as quick. You can't worship as quick. Why? Because bitterness weighs you down and bitterness depresses your spirit. I'm I'm going to say it again. Bitterness has a way of depressing your spirit. If you are struggling with depression today, I want to challenge you to just examine your spirit and say, God, I don't want anything in me that's causing the spirit that you have given me to be depressed. Proverbs 27 and 3 says this, a stone is heavy and sand is weighty. But resentment caused by a fool is heavier than both. Sand is heavy. A stone is heavy. But that resentment that we're carrying in our lives because of what some fool done done to us. God is saying in this word right here, both. He's saying whatever that, that resentment is heavier than all the rest of that stuff. So sometimes we, we, we get hurt and we hold a grudge. And we think that if we hold a grudge, it's our way of getting back at them. I'm not going to let you see a nice side of me. I'm I'm not going to let you see a, a, a good side of me because you hurt me and you cross me and you owe me. And we think that if we act like that toward them and we act offended back at them, that, that, that we're getting even. But listen, bitterness, you think that you what, you what you think is that the bitterness that's in you is your weapon against them. But I'm going to tell you about bitterness. Bitterness is a worthless weapon. Bitterness is a worthless weapon. Somebody ought to put that in the comments. Bitterness is a worthless weapon and it doesn't hurt them. Ultimately, what it does is it only hurts you because here they are. They've gone on with their life. They've totally forgot about the whole thing. And here we are obsessing over what somebody said or what somebody did. And today I've came to tell you that you have the power to listen to God. And you have the power to open your mouth and make a decision that says you will never hurt me another day in my life. Doesn't matter if they apologize. It doesn't matter what they say to you. If they never say say anything to you. You have the ability to determine, whew, I've been hurt by that comment for the last time in my life. We are only hurting ourselves. I believe it was Job 18 and, and verse 4. It says this, you're only hurting yourself with your anger. You're only, I know we've heard people say that before. We've heard people say, listen, you're only hurting you. It ain't hurting them, it's hurting you, but I just gave it to you in scripture. You're only hurting yourself with your anger. So today, 
You need to make the decision, and I need to make the decision to stop, number one, moving outside of the will of God, because what that's going to do is it's going to delay me, and it's going to set me back. If for no other reason, because you don't want to be delayed and you don't want to be set back, you got to root out that hurt that is in your heart, because I don't care what it was, it's not worth you missing the will of God for your life. We have to make the decision to understand and to say, I am not going to stop my happiness because of the hurt that is in my heart. And number three, I refuse to allow my spirit to be suffocated because I cannot be happy and bitter at the same time. Choose ye this day. You're going to be bitter or are you going to be happy? The fourth thing that I want to give you, the fourth reason that you cannot harbor hurt down in your heart is this, because any time, any time that I internalize anger, I harm my own health. Please hear me today. Any time I internalize anger, I harm my own health. So many studies are out there that, that tell us that resentment is one of the most uh, damaging emotions that we can have. And uh, unfortunately, resentment is the source for all kinds of physical ailments that people are dealing with in their life. Job said in 5 and 2, he says, to worry yourself to death with resentment is a foolish, senseless, thing to do, to worry yourself to death with a foolish, uh, uh, with, with resentment is a foolish and senseless thing for us to do. And it's sad to be so incredibly concerned about your diet and incredibly concerned about what you drink, incredibly concerned, I got to get to the gym Every day, I'm just, I'm just obsessed with, with what I drink. I'm obsessed with how I work out. I'm ex obsessed with what I am eating and putting in my body. The bigger issue, my brothers and my sisters, is not about what you are eating. The bigger issue is about what is eating you. What's eating away your happiness? What, what, what's eating against you? What's eating you up? may ultimately shorten your life. So we want to examine, don't be so consumed with, oh, I, I got to drink, I got to get my water in. But at the same time, I am filled with bitterness and I'm filled with hatred and I'm filled with resentment. Honey, you're going to need more than water. You're going to need to ask God to move in your heart and not stop until he cleans out everything that is like him because bitterness is a cancer. I'm going to say it again. Bitterness is a cancer and some people are so full of pride and they're so full of arrogance that they will they refuse to deal with the hurt that's in their heart and so they just let it stay there. You give it a place. What you need to do today is you need to put an eviction notice on that thing and tell it you are not staying in my heart another day. I'm putting you out. I'm setting you out. You are not going to take my life early. You're not going to to make me sick. Bitterness is a cancer and it will eat you up once you give it the authority to stay in your heart. Solomon talked about this. He talked about this in the word. Uh, he talked about it many years ago when he saw that the people were so emotionally upset. In Ecclesiastes 5 and 17, he said, all they get are days that are full of sadness and sorrow and they end up sick defeated and they end up angry and that that, that that falls way short of what the Bible is talking about, what God is talking about when he says, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So God is saying to somebody today, I want to get all of that stuff out of your heart because I'm not through with you. I've got a purpose for your life. You're not listening to me today by accident or chance. God has got your number. You've tuned in today 
because he said, I've got so much that I want to give you. But before I can give it to you, I need you to get in your heart and I need you to root out everything that is there to cut you off, to destroy your destiny and to defeat the purpose of God in your life. Today, let a man examine himself. Look at your heart today. You got to get all of that out of you because your destiny is so much greater than all of that. The fifth reason that we cannot afford to harbor hurt within our hearts is this. Any time I hold a grudge, I hurt many people. Any time I hold a grudge, I hurt many people. It's like COVID-19. Resentment is contagious. I said resentment is contagious. It is, it is a, a disease that is spread verbally. Resentment is a disease that is spread verbally. And you can give it to others by the way that you talk. And in your talk, you can ruin their lives. Too many parents have ruined the lives of children. They didn't, they didn't have to go through it themselves. They just kept hearing about what mama went through and what daddy went through. And they grew up with, with prejudices and they grew up with anger and they grew up resentment over things that they themselves have never been through. Be careful what we say in the presence of other people. Take it, the songwriter said, take it to the Lord in prayer. Be careful what you say because you might just get in the way of somebody else and make them stumble. Hebrews 12 and 15 says, says this. This is our responsibility. Hebrews 12 and 15. Look after each other so that you can keep living in God's grace, being gracious to each other. See that no root of bitterness grows up among you because if you become bitter about anything, you'll miss God's grace, and that will cause much trouble. A bitter person will poison and ruin everyone else. A bitter person. It's sad, but there are so many families today that are, the bitterness is in the root of that family. And you see it whenever people get together. You see it just like the blessing is there. And you can see the blessing. You can sense that root of bitterness. So God said, it's not just affecting you. You need to kill that thing today. Kill it in this generation and tell it you will never go an ounce further. My babies will never have to deal with this mess. I refuse to allow it to live. I'm not going to put it off on them. I'm going to take that thing and bury it today because I refuse to allow it to rule my family tree. I refuse to allow it to rule in my lineage. I refuse to allow it. I have the power because of the grace of God and because I know about the word of God, I have the power to tell that spirit you've come this far but you're not coming any further I take authority over alcoholism you will not run my family you will not run through this family you will not affect my children or my grandchildren or my great grandchildren I take authority over anger I take authority over poverty I take authority over abuse I take authority over it in Jesus name and I say I don't care what I can't help what happened back then but I can help what's going forward and I will take up arms and I will take up the challenge to tell that spirit you have come this far but no further Woo! I'm preaching y'all ought to be saying amen right about now let it go whatever it is let it go. Look at somebody in the room with you and tell them, let it go. Put it in the comments. Let it 
go let it go let it go today not tomorrow let it go today it's stolen the last moment it is going to steal out of your life it's stolen the last ounce of peace it's going to get out of you it is over today we're breaking up I give the bill of divorcement to that spirit you are trespassing you have no right you have no authority the Satan the blood of Jesus is against you I will live in peace I'll raise my children in peace in the name of Jesus let it go and put it out tell it I don't know whose house you're going in but I know whose house you're coming out of and you're coming out of my house and you're coming out today you're coming out I uproot you in the name of Jesus sixth reason that you cannot afford to harbor hurt down even your heart is because any time that you don't let it go what you're acting like is an unbeliever hear me today any time you don't let that thing go any time that you are consumed with taking revenge any time you are consumed with this is what I'm going to say and this is how I'm going to get even. And any time that all of that mess consumes you. And there is a problem with that because what you're doing is you're acting like the world acts. You're acting like people who don't know God, how they act. And it's, it's, it's time out for that. And whether you know it or not, it's possible for believers to act like unbelievers people do it all the time and it's a poor poor testimony it's also a poor testimony when we respond to our problems like the world responds to them because as believers here's here's the truth the truth of the matter is is that as a believer you have in you what God had you have got healing and you've got resources that are in you as a believer but when we choose to hold on to a grudge then God cannot use us to help other people Lord help us how many times have we said Lord you can use anything you can use me but then we because we won't deal with that root of hurt that's inside of us God says you got the resources you've got the ability but I can't use you like I want to use you because you are a physician but you refuse to heal physician heal thyself that's what the word says you if you are so so much of a physician if you are so much of a believer then you have the ability to heal yourself Job said in 36 and 13, angry people without God, they just pile up one grievance after another. And they're always blaming other people for their trouble. Anytime we continue to allow grieving, grievances one after another to pile up in our heart, we are acting like the world acts. And in doing so, we are mishandling the resources that God has given you. I heard this week that, that uh, there was a, a pharmacist somewhere, I believe it was in Indiana or Illinois, somewhere uh, that allowed uh, 500 or so vaccines to ruin and they did it on purpose you know what they were doing they were not being a good I, first of all I don't I don't understand it whether you want a vaccine or not uh, I, I think it's pitiful that somebody who is in that role is not is not going to be a good steward over what people around the world are trying to let, get their hands on how people can do that I, I, I just don't understand it but here's what I here's here's my point this is what I'm trying to say is that they are mishandling resources and at any time here we are walking around having been forgiven we got forgiveness on the inside of us we got victory on the inside of us we got peace on the inside of us but because we won't deal 
with the little bit of hurt or the big amount of hurt that's on the inside of us because we won't confront it and deal with it and we are harboring it and we are giving it a refuge and we are giving it a safe haven because we won't deal with it, then God can't use the resources that he put down inside of us. God, help us. We need to be stewards over what God has given us. And anytime that we allow bitterness and blame to pile up in our hearts we are acting like those who are godless not like those who are godly if you want to act godly anytime you sense that building up in your heart you tell it oh no 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 not this house not today the blood is against you I refuse and, and you know our, our flesh uh, when our feelings are hurt or when we're broken we want somebody to agree with us but more than getting somebody to agree with you you need to go into your prayer closet and say God I want to agree with you and I agree with the fact that you are not pleased when these things start piling up in my heart I don't want them to talk me outside of your will I don't want them to have authority in my life so God says to us in Jones 36 and 13 in the New Living Translation it says it like this the godless, the godless are full of resentment. The godless are full of resentment. It shouldn't be those of us who know Jesus. So today, we have to look at ourselves and say, God, examine my heart. The godless are full of resentment. Because listen, when we are full of resentment, then we cannot be full of God. Hear me. When we are full of resentment, we cannot be full of God. When I am full of resentment, I cannot be full of God's love. Both of those things can't be there. If I am full of resentment, then I cannot be full of the Holy Spirit. And I need the Holy Spirit because he leads me and he guides me into all truth. I need him. I need to hear his voice. I don't need resentment sounding louder in my head than the Holy Spirit sounds. I need to shut up the resentment, the voice of accusation. I need to shut that up so that I can hear what the Spirit says. Here's my last one, the seventh reason that we cannot afford to harbor her in our heart is because of this. Any time that I won't forgive, I block God's forgiveness. Ooh, let me say that again. Any time that I won't forgive, I personally block God's forgiveness in my own life. Matthew 6 and 15, Jesus said this, If you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. If you refuse to forgive others, the Father will not forgive your sins. Do you hear that? That's a pretty high price to pay. That's extremely high. That might be the fiercest out of all of them. That might be the most expensive out of all of them. When we block God's, when we block our forgiveness to others, we are blocking God's forgiveness to us. I can't expect to receive what I need from God when I will not offer that to other people and I have, when I have the power to offer it. In other words, let me say it like this because you might see it better like this. If I am unforgiving, I will be unforgiven. Say it again. If I am unforgiving, I will be unforgiven. If I am unforgiving, I will be unforgiven. Somebody that's listening today, you need to swallow your pride. Yes, that's what I said. Swallow your pride. Reach out to somebody that you know there is a problem with. It don't matter if they receive it. Reach out to them. 
tell them, look, you know what? I got to forgive, and I'm going to ask you to forgive me because we both need God to forgive us. If I am unforgiving, then I will be unforgiven. And that's a high price for us to have to pay. Harboring hurt is costly. Is holding a grudge really worth it? Is being bitter really worth it? Is refusing to let the other person off the hook really worth it? Because when I harbor hurt, I move outside of the will of God. I retain resentment and I stop my own happiness. Number three, I suffocate my own spirit. Number four, I harm my own health. Number five, I hurt other people. Number six, I act like an unbeliever. Number seven, I block my own forgiveness and none of it is worth it. Bitterness is not worth it. Resentment is not worth it. That's why I say to you today, let it go. Get it out of you. How do I do that? James gave us three really cool points. Write them down. I'm going to say them fast and I'm done. How do I get it out of me, pastor? Number one, you give it to God and you leave it there. You don't give it to, to him and wait a week or two and pick it back up. Give it to God. Let him handle it. Unload on him. Tell him. I preached that to you last week. He can handle it. Tell him how you feel. Tell him who hurt you. Tell him how they hurt you. Tell him how it made you feel. And tell him you are struggling with letting it go. He knows you. He knows your frame. He knows how you're wired. He knows the battle that's going on inside of you. Mark 11 and 25 says, whenever you pray, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him and let it drop. Just leave it. Let it go in order that your Father in heaven may also forgive you for your failings and your shortcomings. And he lets them drop. Let it drop. Let it go. God is saying, when you cut other people slack, I'm going to cut you some slack. Hear that. When you give somebody else a break, I'm going to give you a break. It, let me tell you something. It takes a lot less energy to drop it than it does to carry it. Listen to me, church. I got this pulpit in my hand and it's heavy. It's taking a lot of energy. I'm dropping it. Whew. Man, that sure feels better. I'm not, mo I'm not burning up energy trying to carry something that's too heavy for me. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8, Paul said, what is needed everywhere is for people to lift holy hands in prayer instead of having anger and resentment. You know what he's telling us? Instead of getting your hands full of stuff that you ain't got no business trying to carry and now you're exhausted, he's saying, throw it down, lift up your hands in prayer. Don't, get rid of all the anger, get rid of the resentment. And if you'll talk to God about it, he will help us. He'll help us lift the load. He'll help us carry it. Or he'll show us how to lay it down. Romans 12 and 9 says, never avenge yourselves. Leave that. That's what my mama was saying when she said, Cheryl, two wrongs don't make a right. What she was saying is this battle is not yours. 
This battle belongs to the Lord. I don't know who I'm talking today, uh, who I'm talking to today, but there's somebody that's watching me and you've been consumed with, I can't believe that they said that. I can't believe that they did that. I'm going to find a way to get back to them. I'm going to let them know I can, I, I, I'm tougher than that. I'm going to let them know that I can say what I want to say. I'm going to let them know that I, that they don't have, they ain't got the last word. I got the last word. But let me tell you something. Never avenge yourselves. Leave that to God. That's what it says. Leave that to God. For he has said that he will repay those who deserve it. Vengeance is mine, saith God. And I will repay. Listen, paying those people back is above your pay grade. And they're going to get off easy. If you decide to do it, let it go. Let it go. Give it to God. The second thing that we do to get it out of us is we heal it with grace. We heal it with grace. In other words, we offer grace to the person that hurt us. What that does is it ricochets back and it heals us. So you heal yourself when you offer grace to somebody else. Ephesians 4 and 32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as God has forgiven you. Colossians 4 and 6 says, Everything you say should be kind and it should be well thought out so that you know how to answer everyone. If you make kindness your language, then you have the ability to answer everyone. Because you're not sitting here trying to figure out, what, can I, well, what am I going to say? What am I going to say next? No. I'm going to offer kindness. Because, listen, don't get mad at me. I'm, 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 not the, I'm not the message today. I'm just the mailman that's bringing it. This is not my words. This is God's word. I love how it says it in the Message Bible. Same verse, Colossians 4 and 6. Be gracious in your speech. The goal is to bring out the best in others in a conversation. Not to put them down, nor to cut them out. But let grace heal your hurt. So you give your hurt to God. You heal it with grace. And here's the last one. You nail it to the cross. Galatians 5 and 24 says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed their sinful attitudes and desires to his cross and crucified them there. So now silence the Holy Spirit. I, I'm not silence. So now since the Holy Spirit has given you new life, and new power let us follow his leading in every part every part of our lives let us not be pridefully stubborn pridefully stubborn there it is let us not be pridefully stubborn or irritate each other or be jealous of each other and that is another message in and of itself Today, the word of the Lord comes to you, comes to our nation. It's easy for us to sit in our homes and look on TV and be appalled at what we've seen this week. I get it. I've been there. But I have to pause and ask myself, have I prayed for people? I prayed for those that are thugs, those that are trespassing, those that have desecrated something. If I pray for them as much as I've been mad at them, let me tell you something. If not, what happens is I'm I get offended at what they did. I'm angry at what they did. Next thing you know, before I know it, I've got stuff building up in my heart. No, it ain't right. And you know what I do? I pray that 
justice prevail. But I put it in the hands of God. Some people have been worried themselves sick over this election. Even stood up, preachers have stood up and prophesied. They just lied. Trying to prophesy things into existence. Let me tell you something. Pray. Put it in the hands of God. And if you believe he's really sovereign, then trust. Trust him. Don't break up with your family. Don't hurt people you love or people you're going to need or people that need you. Because it didn't go like you said. I bet you're going to think twice before you stand up there and say, God said. You need to. He's sovereign. He'll do what he's going to do. But what we have to do is honor his word. Honor those who are in authority. And if we'll do that, he will honor us.